9 today. In a moment, we'll hear from Channel 11 Sports Director John Fedko. Right now, let's go live to the home of Jerry Dulac of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, who was on this program earlier this week, predicting uh, nothing specific, but that something else was in the works, but you didn't know what, Jerry. You, you know, John, I, uh, you're right. Uh, we were saying last night that, uh, I, you know, I thought that this thing wasn't done being played out and something else was going to happen and then this today and uh, I am surprised on one hand and when you take a step back and look at the thing logically and from a business point of view which is what the Roonies did John um, I'm not surprised uh, but I know it shocked a lot of people and I've been talking to some of the players and and uh, trying to get some people around the league and a lot of people are surprised by what happened today well I am I am shocked and amazed and I have to eat some crow because I predicted they would do absolutely nothing once again proving how much I know but having said <laughs> can you show us any of uh, what the players have told you I know we'll read about it in the Post Gazette tomorrow but can you give us a hint well I think I think basically uh, John their reaction is one of uh, some of the players I mean, a lot of other people are shared uh, sharing right now which is they're surprised as, as well. Uh, Nolan Harrison, who is defensive end and is a big cow supporter, um, he was in Chicago. He was on his cell phone and he was uh, visiting his, his, taking his newborn daughter to uh, meet her grandmother for the first time. And he also walked. He saw that happened, and you know, he it, it said that he never dreamed that the uh, alleged feud between Howard and Dunno was more than just what he read in the newspapers and what he would hear on TV. He said, you know, I thought that was stuff that you guys wrote about. And, uh, you know, I mean, there were the Roonies today, John, at the press conference acknowledged the tension between the two and said it was an environment that they, uh, you know, they couldn't work with. And it, it became uh, intolerable for all parties, including Bill Cowher, uh, John, who went into the meeting and, and pretty much, uh, you know, pulled a power play and said, it's me or him. And, uh, you know, when you look at it, hey, John, this is a coach who has been in the playoffs six uh, straight years when he first started. He's a very successful coach. Um, when you look at the candidates out there to be head coaches, they, Bill Cowher is at the top of that list by far. And don't forget the fact, too, that he still is owed $6 million, $2 million each year for the next three years. Uh, that helps in the decision, too. Jerry, let me ask you one more question because I told you I wouldn't keep you long because I know you're in the middle of writing a couple of stories for tomorrow morning's editions. But uh, Dan Rooney also said in today's news conference that he's known Tom Donahoe since high school. There's no question about so it. So how did Bill Cowher win the power play if they're so tight for so long? John, that's what's baffling to a lot of people. But again, it goes back to what I said. It was purely a business decision. But I can tell you one thing. I, I guarantee you Dan Rooney is having a hard time sleeping tonight because this is the, a decision he would not want to make. He has known Tom Donahoe. Tom Donahoe is a first-rate person, and now they had to ax this guy and and keep Bill Cower, and uh, because they're looking at it from a business point of view, it's easier to find a personnel guy than it is to find a quality head coach, and particularly one who's been in the playoffs uh, six straight years when he first started. As I mentioned, three AFC title games in four years. That's why it was such a tough decision, and that's why it shocked some people who never thought he would fire Tom Donahoe. But I might remind you, this is the same person who once fired his brother. Uh, indeed. Okay, well, that's an excellent point. Jerry Dulac, thanks so much for coming on the show. We'll look for you in future episodes of Night Talk. John, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but glad to join you. That's all right. Let's take a break, and let's find out what uh, Channel 11 Sports Director John Fedko thinks about all of this when Night Talk continues in a moment. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Dick, the director, is telling me we can't take a break right now. He, once again, the superior technology of the Pittsburgh Cable News Channel overrules actual common sense programming. Is that true that we cannot take a break now, Dick? Well, not too, too much. We can? Okay, let's take a break. We're breaking now. Give us a break. Back in the a The official transportation provider of my talk is Pittsburgh Limousine. Whether it's... Ladies and gentlemen, I'm told because of the superior technology, uh, technically speaking, of the Pittsburgh Cable News Channel, that the first 30 seconds of the program they actually didn't get on the air, but that's par for the course at this uh, bucket of bolts, rat trap we call a TV station. However, I assume you got the general, hey, we're going to black. I assume more evidence of what I am speaking of. I assume that you got the news that Tom Donahoe, director of football operations, uh, has resigned. We just talked to Jerry Dulac about it from the Post Gazette. Here is Channel 11 sports director John Fedko. I'm just amazed by this. Are you not? You you called it on your show? Yeah. I, Fedko phone I want to give myself a little pat on the back too. I was calling this all last week that one of them would be gone. One of them would be fired. And at that point, I said 50-50. Now I thought it would be Bill Cowher, in my opinion. But uh, as the weeks got on, and especially after what happened on uh, 
uh, Tuesday with the announcement that Cow was going to be back, I still thought the Donahoe could be gone. Now, I am not surprised at all that this happened. No? I am, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not surprised that one of them is gone. Now, again, I'll be honest with you, when they, the Steelers call us at 10 after 5 today and said there's a press conference, I thought it was Cower. I thought Cower was going to resign. It, it, this is all. How do you think Cower won the power struggle? Well, first of all, is, is it what Dulac said, which essentially is that it's uh, easier to find somebody who does what Tom does than it is to find uh, uh, to find a new head coach who's as good as Cower? I, first of all, I just want to say that that uh, Dan Rooney deserves an awful lot of credit just for having. Um, uh, there's a word I want to say, but I won't the say cojones? it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to to make a very tough business decision for him, he is much better friends and works at a more personal level with Tom Donahoe than he does with Bill Cower. But he let uh, Tom Donahoe go because he knows that Bill Cower, you know, is potentially has shown to be one of the better coaches in the National Football League, and Tom and and Dan Rooney knows that he can get a better player personnel man than Tom Donahoe in here, and that man is Tom Modrak. Now, Tom Modrak has been with the Philadelphia Eagles for the last two years as their director of football operations, what Tom Donahoe's been doing here. However, Modrak was with the Steelers for 20 years, from 1979 uh, until 1998. And for nine of those years, Tom Modrak was the director of college scouting. And for those nine years that Modrak was the director of college scouting, it was Modrak who was producing the incredible drafts that led the Steelers to the Super Bowl in 1998. He brought in Levon Kirkland, Joel Steed, Chad Brown. He's the guy who brought in the young talent. Remember, Donahoe was the director of football operations, was in charge of everything, you know, getting free agents. Of course, Donahoe did pull off the big Jerome Bettis deal, but it was Tom Modrak who we can thank for those drafts. And I don't think, John, that it's a coincidence that when Modrak left in 98, we've had two bad seasons and things have gone downhill. Now look, it's cyclical in the National Football League, okay? But in my opinion, Dan Rooney and Art Rooney II, his son, sat down on closed doors and said, look, if we fire Bill Cowher, we're going to have a hard time replacing him. If we fire Tom Donahoe, we got a guy we can go out and get that we think's better, and that's Tom Modrak. He's been with the organization for 20 years before. He left for the Eagles a couple years ago. Let's go get him. I am here to predict on this show that Tom Modrak's going to get this job and the Steelers are going to do everything in their power Power to get Tom Modrak out of that Eagles contract. But that's a problem, John, because Tom Modrak is under contract with the Philadelphia Eagles. He's had problems with Eagles ownership because they're meddlesome. However, Eagles ownership, I think right now, is going to call Tom Modrak probably tonight and say, we love you, Tom. You're the man. Uh, we don't want you to go anywhere because he is turning that Eagles program around. So, you know, Carnell Lake was quoted in the paper this morning uh, in Ron Cook's column, I think, as saying he knows the Steelers have salary cap problems, but in his view, other teams manage a better job of keeping their better players longer, despite the fact that everybody's got salary cap problems. Whose fault is that? Is that the Rooney's? Is that Donahoe? Is that one reason you well, think they get I in think, the axe? I think it's all of the above. However, I think it has to come down to Tom Donahoe because he's the guy who was in charge of player personnel. Look, I've been very critical of some of Tom Donahoe's moves, uh, specifically not signing Yancey Thigpen, but that, the owner at that time, Dan Rooney, said we're not going to pay $4 million to a receiver. But uh, they, they lost Yancey Thigpen, a guy I think they could have kept. They lost Leon Searcy, one of the best tackles in the league, a guy I think they could have kept. Now, they may not have been able to keep Chad Brown, but maybe through some kind of uh, creative financing they could have. But Chad Brown is one maybe they couldn't have kept. But uh, th there are some blunders, I think, that were made by, the, by, by Tom Donahoe. But the bottom line is that the drafts have not been very good the last few years. And... Uh, I just think that Modrak is the perfect fit here. I think a lot of things went into this decision, John. What Jerry and I talked about, the fact that Bill Cowher would be difficult to replace. But I think that one of the major factors they decided to say Tom Donahoe's gone is because they want Tom Modrak. They think there's a guy out there who is better. This was strictly a business decision made by the Steelers. And if they get Modrak, John, I think it was a great one. I think it was a great one. I, first of all, there's no way that Cower and Donahoe could have worked together. I've been saying that for two weeks. No, I'm not saying that Danny Rooney was listening to me, but if some uh, plebe like me is saying it, okay, some goofball sportscaster that the two guys can't work together just from the information I know, you know they're down in the office saying, you know, these guys are two huge egos, which they, you have to be in this business. But when two huge egos don't like each other and don't talk to each other, it's detrimental to the organization. One of them had to go. If the Steelers can get Tom Modrak, a Pittsburgh guy, 
Wright, graduated from Indiana University, uh, raised his family around here for 20 years. I think this is going to be a brilliant move by Dan Rooney. And that's a big if. If they don't get Modrak, there's not a lot of the big name guys out there. There's Charlie Casserly, the guy who was fired by the Redskins, but he's going to get the job in Houston in their new expansion franchise. So I, I think the Rooney's are going to do everything in their power to get Modrak. Thanks for advancing the story, okay. sir. And we'll look more for, uh, from you at uh, 10 o'clock on PCNC and 11 o'clock on Channel 11. Yes, and on 11.30 on the Fedco Phone Zone. Jerry DePaulo is going to join us on the beat 11.30 on the, the Fedco Phone Zone with Jerry DePaulo of the Tribune. Where you would have heard this story two weeks ago right. in, uh, in some form or fashion. Back in a moment with Free For All Night. Stay with us on Night Talk on the Pittsburgh Cable News Channel. Night Talk is sponsored in part by Highfield Open MRI, the strongest open magnet in Pittsburgh. Back on Night Talk with our all-star free-for-all panel, State Senator, Congressional wannabe, Melissa Hart, political analyst extraordinaire, John <laughs> Delano, and amazing uh, WPTT talk show host, 12 to 3 every day, Lynn Cullen. My heaven, cute. Yeah. I'm honored to be uh, in the presence of greatness such as that of yourselves. We're surrounded by uh, WTT talk show hosts. Yes, I'm a fill-in yes, WTT. Yes, right. Oh, all right. Uh, none of you guys may know anything about sports, or maybe you do, uh, or but you may still have it. I, actually, I know that Lynn actually does know a little bit something about sports. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a Hacker fan. I mean. Not, well, what are you oh, yeah, trying I'm not to supposed do? to say that. All right. Not in this all right. Not in this oh, well, I'm from Green Bay, so I grew up on on, on football. I'm a Packer fan, and I'm a Steeler fan. So how about this Donahoe thing? It's uh. Pretty wild, Listen, pretty wacky. I know one of them had to go, quite obviously. Yeah. I was shocked because I thought the Roonies were too much of uh, just plain crotchety old fuddy duddies who were setting their ways and just walking around. Well, I guess it didn't work this year. It'll work next year. <laughs> so I was wrong. I was totally yes. wrong, See and that? I must eat you crow on the air. <laughs> um, I have to admit I'm surprised. I, I, I sort of thought they'd let Cower go, if you want to know the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or that Cower would resign in a huff or something. Something. If that's possible. I, mean, I am a bit surprised because of, I guess, Donahue. Is it Hugh or Ho? Donahue. 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 Why do oh, people you know what's always weird? say Hugh right, instead there's Mark, of Ho? Mark Madden says Donahoe, the, this radio yeah, sports guy. Donahoe. And today, uh, as I understand it, Rooney said, I've known him since high school, but he called him Donahue. He's known the guy since high school, and he mispronounces his name. It's Donahoe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, he's your neighbor. Not, he's a neighbor. Uh, Tom is a not neighbor Not anymore, of mine. he's not. He's got well, a yeah, sale yeah, right. signs going we'll up. Our, our value in our neighborhood will what? Well, I don't go know. Down? No, 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 I'm sorry. Not having, having a GM famous there. person. I'll, I'll lose value of, of my house. Did you go knock on his door, sniff around, see what you could find out, John? No, I haven't done that yet. I really haven't. He... Tom Donahoe is the nicest guy. He and his family, I know his parents, I know his younger brother and I went to uh, school together. His younger brother, you know. And uh, really a very, uh, just a wonderful fella, very down to earth. I think that's what you said that, John Fed. He's, he's yeah, a guest he's been on the show several times, Donahoe. Uh, his wife was actually, I'm told, a viewer of the show of Semi Free. His wife gave me a tie. His wife took pity on my uh, horrible wardrobe early <laughs> on and gave me a tie. <laughs> so I'm really going to miss him. Because yeah. when you get free stuff yeah. from people. Well, he, he, as I say, he's the nicest fellow around uh, but this is a business judgment and this team belongs to the Roonies and in my view Art and Dan Rooney have every right to make business decisions and that's what they did they made a very I think a very straightforward business decision that these two people can't work together and so they're gonna go with one and not the other mm -hmm. and Melissa you don't care one way or the other Nope. <laughs> an honest politician, ladies and gentlemen. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. She's running for office. I, I, I do care. She offends no one. No, I do care. I just want oh, those to do well. She offends plenty of people. For, we're going to get to the offending Are the Tribune Review. Well, later. I always thought that Tom no, no. Donahoe was better looking than Bill Cowher. Oh, and there so, oh there's yes, a basis to pick our general man, managers. And yeah. now we don't get to see us. We never saw him much anyway. Right. He sort of no, had a low a profile. Quiet, right. but, and yet yeah. you don't hear any you know, rumors about Donahoe like you used to about the coach. Oh, geez. Oh, here, we here we go. Here we go. It took all of about three minutes. Remember we were talking about right. rumors. That's Let right. me move on to one more sports thing, and in fact, a couple of more sports things, but one more before we have to take the next break. I would like to, uh, you guys to look at a piece of videotape. Oh, no. Here is the coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins, Herbie Brooks. Last night, <laughs> after playing the Colorado Avalanche in Denver, Matthew Barnaby, who's the big enforcer of the Penguins, and by the way, I know nothing about hockey, but that much I've learned. <laughs> I agree, yeah. He was hurt, this uh, Penguin player, because he got a bad cross-check to his head mm -hmm. and by some guy named Alexei uh, Garasov. Damn foreigners are screwing up everything. So the Avalanche announcer John Kelly says of Matthew Barnaby, the Penguins player, he has a propensity to exaggerate injuries, acted like he was dogging it. Uh, so Coach Brooks confronted 
the announcer later in the stadium hallway. Hello. Let's take a look at the initial call by the announcer okay. and then the confrontation. Carnaby yes. in the past has been known to embellish injuries, potential injuries. I'm not sure if uh, this I can't is real or yeah. not. Hey, I'm Gordon. Did you make that call on Barnaby? What's that? You say he has a tendency to embellish when he's down on the ice? Is that your call? Oh, you want to talk Was that you? your call? You want to talk Was that your call? Was that your call? Was that your call? Was that your call? Hey. You say he has a tendency to embellish? Hey. You almost tore his head up, you could have killed him. I can't believe that. That's my opinion. That's your opinion? It's a horse <laughs> opinion. You understand? Get your out of here. You're not going to kick me out of here. I'll kick your ass right all over, the, all over the place. All right? Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, more, you know, I just love the That's way. hockey. They push, they push each other. They push each other around. That's the God way it is. Well, he's standing up for his player. You would expect that. I think it's a bunch of... The guy is 12 years old. I think all these coaches and all the Sick professional leagues need That's to awesome. grow up and stop being macho morons, and they don't realize that even if people in the press are obnoxious idiots, they still have a right to say that. I don't mind him calling them on what he thought was a stupid right. thing to say, but to use all this macho crap and threatening is to that, beat yeah. this... Hey, did you call... Hey, did you call? Checking hey, him in the hallway? You, right. Are we in high school now, or have we no. grown up and gotten actual jobs, and we have to have a semi it's just, it's so depressing. code of conduct? And you know what? He, it, I'm sorry, but he so, you know he sounds like this too. He. Did you say he? Did oh. you say? Yeah, Brooks. Where's he from originally? <laughs> well, I think he's from Minnesota. Oh, oh no. Oh, yeah. oh, it's doubly obnoxious yeah, because yeah. I'm not only are you doing it, but uh, you got yeah. that nasality that makes it really particularly revolting. Are their noses always clogged from colds up there? Uh, you know, I don't know where it comes from. It's ice. <laughs> it freezes. You know, up the there. nasal passages freeze. Have you ever really been in like below zero weather? It does. Everything freezes up there. It hurts to breathe. Ooh. And then so, you get yeah. So he spends too much time on the ice. This is the reason. I th it might be. I don't know what it is, but I'm so sick and tired of really. It, Everybody's like the people in a simple plan, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. right. All right, what's your next sports? Uh? But uh, you know, like, when, when, when did life become the Jerry Springer show? I still don't understand why the coach has the right to verbally and physically assault uh, a reporter right there. Is he going to get some psychological training for this? Oh, right. Oh, there we go. All right. Well, um, let's uh, segue the in, into uh, the John Rocker uh, topic, oh, no. and then we it's will talk list. politics with these guys since that's uh, what they really know. Know about uh, in a moment on Night Talk of the Pittsburgh Cable News Channel. <laughs> Back at Night Talk on Free for All Night with State Senator Melissa Hart, congressional wannabe. Uh, political analyst John Delano and amazing WPTT talk shows. Um, so, uh, Johnny Rocker, I guess you're all sick of talking about that. He made all the racist, homophobe remarks and the remarks against uh, pregnant women uh, whom uh, he termed unwed mothers. And let's see, he called uh, one of his players uh, a member of a minority group, uh, one of his fellow players a fat monkey, and blah, 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 blah. So now they've ordered psychological testing oh, for him. I wish they'd just either fire his butt or suspend him for uh, a couple of months. Uh, because why do you have to psychoanalyze an idiot racist? Well, it's, it's, a it's actually a dangerous kind of a, yes. a, a precedent in suggesting that because somebody holds, uh, you know, the wrong kind of political views, then there must be something sort of psychologically wrong with them. This makes you uh, remember how we used to look with, you know, horror at the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Whenever somebody there didn't, uh, you know, toe the proper politically mm -hmm. correct line, what did yeah. they do with them? They yeah, put them in a mental, a mental institution right. in right. Siberia. Think, this yeah. is very much like that. Well, uh, it is It is, and it isn't. I mean, first of all, I think the psychological training or evaluation is nuts in and of itself. <laughs> I think it was just an easy excuse for them not to do anything. Exactly. Right. Now, if you're going to be, it seems to me, it, this isn't really an issue of free speech. Because no. if you're going to be participating in, in professional baseball, Professional baseball has the right to impose its own standards yeah. on its players, its coaches, and everybody. And if one of those standards is that you are not going to be racist, at least not outwardly racist, then, not they, in public, anyway. then they, they can impose that standard and they can, it seems to me, 
impose discipline when when a racist statement is made. Uh, so yeah, but he has a good fastball. Come on, uh, well, that, that's him. why that's why they're doing this easy I out. I agree. That's so why the easy just, out. Well, why don't they find him then, or sanction him, or say you're a jerk? We're gonna we're gonna yeah. you know sanction you. But what this does is it really gives a really much more negative stigma to mental health problems. When when somebody who could have a mental health problem would know no more run out and call people a racist than anybody who's sitting here yeah. who may or may yeah. not have a mental health problem. I think and in fact, so, it, it's where so Rocker, Rocker is giving people with mental health problems a bad, a bad name. name. <laughs> he is. It's, very trivia, it's true. And it trivializes the, the real social problem of racism and, and all these other, and, and, and prejudice. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A lot of what he said was not necessarily racist. It's just hateful it and stupid right. and yeah. It's, right. He's an ignoramus. Since mm -hmm. when is that against the law? Now you're right. If it holds the, if, if it, it destroys morale on the team and that kind of thing, well, then the team maybe can decide that he's sure. No I mean, they have as an organization, of it, as a company, as a business, they have a right to impose a not standard. Not a medical issue, and it's not right. a psychological. Yeah, it right, should be one. But they way. won't. They won't even give him a slap on the wrist, will they? Because uh, he's coming out now and he's pretending to be uh, repentant contrite. and yes. contrite. Yes. And uh, by the way, uh, the, the guest commentator John Rocker at the end of the program. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stay tuned. So, uh, oh but don't, so uh, do you guys? I actually do think they had to do something: sanction him, fine him. Yes. yes. And they're not. Yeah. They're never going to fire. If they him. started uh, fining him. and sanctioning every ignoramus, <laughs> and every baseball. bigot, <laughs> every racist that's in major league sports, there'd be nobody there. I agree. But but just the ones who say things poor. publicly. They well, then don't. also, it's only a sin if you're stupid enough to say it with the, a reporter around or a camera rolling. It's a good so, start. But I think they they end up action, acting as if they don't care that he made those remarks and they don't care about the issues right. involved. Yeah. Right, because if little, they don't do little kids look to those people as heroes. That's just a reality of, of American life. So I think it's the responsibility of Major League, anything, to say, you know, mm -hmm. there's a certain standard of behavior that we require, and if you, if you don't present that standard, then there's a problem for you. So Let's say you, they you let him go. Whatever. If they let him go, uh, the pirates could use him. I'm serious. They couldn't afford it based on his talent. Not his I am mouth. talking about his talent. Right. So, right. what would you, as a pirate fan, assuming that we all want the pirates to win, would you uh, would you support? The, uh, I wouldn't want him. I definitely wouldn't want him. I just don't want an idiot around like that. We have enough yeah. idiots in this town. How old is this about guy? One more. Uh, like 20, 20, 25, is it? 25, 26. 25, yeah, mid-20s. He's yeah. a kid who yeah. doesn't know anything and has never been anything, but, you know. Mm -hmm. We'll take him. We'll teach him. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you've taught a few uh, rednecks a few things over the years, Melissa. Sure, why not? Yeah. <laughs> she works with them in Harrisburg, you know. <laughs> oh. All right, let's talk about let's talk about there. Melissa's record in Harrisburg, shall we? Here, let's, uh, talk uh -oh. let's talk about the felons in Harrisburg. Yeah. Yes, you know what I want to get to that in a minute. People under suspicion. I do want to get to that, and in fact, that's an excellent topic. But uh, this a, this was a lance in today's Pittsburgh Tribune review yes, I saw and that. criticism of Senator Hart. The 40th District Republican announced she'll seek the GOP nomination for the fourth congressional district seat, being. Uh, vacated by Ron Klink. You're reading this as if you haven't she seen hasn't it yet. Seen it. Oh <laughs> man! Oh, cool. This is cool. Hey, you're getting news on the right. McIntyre. Uh, who is seeking the Democratic nomination for the U.S. Senate? We wish Ms. Hart. Uh, ah. Well, but she needs a little hypocrisy reduction training. Ah, they're going to send you to John Rocker's psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> while, while she keeps touting her role in getting government off our backs, she conveniently forgets <laughs> about her role in keeping government in our pockets, uh, the 1977, 1997 stadiums, tax referendum, and Plan B. Ooh. So what do you think of them, Apples, Missy? I think that that's a misrepresentation of what went on there. Do you? Well, well, they did Ms. stick Hart's their fingers in their pockets. The, Ms. Hart's role in Plan A. The <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this the Bob Dole approach? You yes, refer to yourself in the, the third, third person. person. <laughs> 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 no, actually, well, what I did during the referendum was make distance. sure it was a referendum. I mean, there are people out there who wanted us to just simply raise the tax. Weren't you for Plan A? I was for Plan A. Plan A oh, was a referendum, was, all right. Yeah. Which was a referendum. And that was back when you were dating Kevin McClatchy. I was never. No? <laughs> That's what everybody well, said. John no. will you Th this stop. But, but, the, but the point is, anyway, that they need to open their minds a little bit and look at the big picture, the whole story. I thought you, well, you were in like Flynn with uh, Dickie Cougar Mellon in the right. game. What yeah. are they doing? <laughs> well, you know, this, this is prelude so. to their endorsing her later of in the course, year. Of course, of course. I mean, this, uh, we're going to slap you around a little bit at the start of the campaign, and then, oh, yeah. you're going to get the endorsement. Of course. I, as sure as you and I and Lynn are sitting here, I think so you too. will be endorsed by the Tribune Review. Predictions. I predicted right here and now. Oh, but I, right. but this is going to be an issue. 
in the campaign against you. For, at least if uh, Matt Attorney Mangino, well, if Matt Mangino, the Lawrence County District Attorney, wins the He's Democratic the show, nomination, huh? he opposes Plan A and B. He, and he opposes using tax dollars for stadiums, and he's going to wrap it around your. You pretty know what? Little so. neck. <laughs> <laughs> My little neck. My little doctor. <laughs> All right, I think I'm melting. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we will investigate these alleged uh, felons in the state legislature with our panel. Stay with us. Senator Melissa Hart, John Delano, and Lynn Cullen. Uh, so Frank Serafini, as you all know, apparently was convicted of perjury, and, and apparently there's a portion of the state constitution which says, if you are a state representative and you are convicted of a felony, you must be uh, immediately Out. expelled. He yet, uh, the House Republican leadership has not seen fit to throw him out. Uh, nobody will throw him out. Uh, Attorney General uh, Mike Fisher is calling for him to, to leave. But today the Post-Gazette editorialized against the governor for not taking a strong stand and making sure that they throw mm -hmm. Serafini's butt out. Right. This, so, is, this has become, think? well, this is a real embarrassment, I think, to the House Republicans. Now, let's separate. Melissa's in the state Senate. Yes. And as far as I know, the yeah. state senators right. have not been involved in yeah, this. Yeah, she's yeah. embarrassing but, on a whole other level. <laughs> but the Republican state House leadership and... Um, the rank and file too because they're the ones who voted against efforts to expel uh, Frank Serafini are really not only violating the Constitution but they're standing up for a proposition that makes no sense which is that convicted felons <laughs> should stay in the state house there's only one Democrat from this area who supports that proposition now and who, who would that be and voted for the same resolution that our Republican neighbors voted for and that was state representative Frank, Frank Gigliotti, Gigliotti, who also that believes cried. that you are, a, if you are a convicted felon, <laughs> you should stay in the House of Representatives. That guy's got cojones for running again, I think. Yeah. I, big, I, big, well, huge breasts. Well, he, he uh, big, giant. He's innocent. <laughs> Innocent until yeah. proven guilty, John. Yeah, that's right. Um, but as you guys read the state constitution, and I really haven't read oh, the state I, constitution. Yes. We, we you do, do that, that all the time. Right? On a regular basis. There, but my, yeah. my point is, uh, even he may win on appeal, I suppose, although I doubt it. But you, you're supposed to get rid of him anyway. If that's he's right. convicted, well, he's here, out. Here's right? why. Because you know, and I know, and Melissa's a lawyer, you can tie this up in court for years and years and years on appeals. That would mean that you essentially, once convicted, could stay in office forever. forever. Ever. Yeah. And so of what point is the state constitution if you apply that interpretation? The interpretation, it seems to me, is the one that the Attorney General, Mike Fisher, also a Republican, has taken, which is, once convicted, you're out. Hey, are these well, the same Republicans who are all about, you know, getting tough on crime <laughs> and that people should take responsibility for their own actions and all this stuff? I mean, it is just so astonishingly that's the thing it's not the party uh, it, is not, it has nothing to do with the party it's the institution it's the people it doesn't matter Serafini could have been a Democrat or a Republican it doesn't matter it's How the guys who, can they be they've been in office for a long time they feel like they are not the same as you or anyone the else. rules don't, don't apply well, yeah it's a let, let's ask with. the senator do you support the Attorney General in this or the House Republican leaders? Oh, the, yeah. In fact, I have a very good friend who's a member of the House uh, who's also a Republican who called me and said, I don't want to vote to keep this guy. And I said, then don't vote to keep this guy. And actually, he was one of the guys that broke with the Yeah, there the were about group. six Republicans and, who voted against. No, I think it's outrageous. Um, so you're with we, Fisher. Oh, you're yeah. Oh, very much so. And in fact, we had that happen in the Senate. Well, we had uh, Bill Stinson, who was a senator, mm -hmm. who was, uh, you know, had the problems with the votes, the, the La Nueva Forma de Votar, where they went and talked to the Spanish-speaking, <laughs> it was the Spanish-speaking people in Philadelphia. Yeah. They told him there was a new way to vote. That's what that means. He knew this. And uh, it's it basically convinced these people that yeah. they could vote by absentee ballot and somebody uh, else did, did right. vote for them. <clears throat> and this guy oh my God. In. He resigned. He ended up leaving. Um, right. He was removed and replaced by um, someone else, by a judge, mm -hmm. because of the crimes that he committed. Well, and the fact but is there's a precedent even in the House. Twenty years ago, Democrats, Democratic legislators mm -hmm. did the same thing, uh, convicted of uh, crimes. And the House leadership, the Democratic leadership, stalled for a little bit, but eventually they just they had to flip-flop yeah. because uh, of the public According pressure. to the Post-Gazette editorial today, <laughs> six times in history somebody's been convicted of a felony, and on all other six occasions they've either resigned yeah. or been removed. Well, well, the dirty little secret here is that what the House Republicans are trying to do is to postpone the date 
on which uh, Mr. Serafini resigns. Now, why are they doing that? Because if they wait until after the uh, 4th of February, they can schedule a special election at taxpayer expense. Instead of scheduling the special election to elect a successor on the same date of the primary, which is April 4, they'll schedule it for, you know, June 1st or some other day where no one will come out to vote thinking that only their Republican voters will come out to vote and a Republican will be elected that's the dirty little secret well, I don't think that's the reason I think the reason isn't because uh, they think they're gonna be able to control the vote at that time I think the reason is because they want to have a majority during this budget season and they will right. have a majority during budget season if they can but even if, if they goes, can postpone they have the election majority, don't they they, well, they have a two, vote. Not, well, they have a two vote very close and, and what you find during the budget is there's a lot of horse trading and in the house there's already a lot of horse trading because yeah. it's so narrow that's why um ralph kaiser harry reedshaw dave marinick three democrat house members around here get stuff for their districts because they, they vote with the republicans with the Republican leadership. Right. Uh, let's take a break, and when we come back, I want to ask Senator Hart about this really cool Marcus. perk I hear they have, where you can get like 600 bucks a month to lease a car, and they still give you mileage. Oh, that's old news. <laughs> Is that? Well, that's it's new to me. Well, they can also the fly to Harrisburg. No way. Not the Senate. It's a house. The official transportation provider of Night Talk is Pittsburgh Limousine, the one clear choice in transportation. I talk it's free for all night with Melissa Hart, John Delano, and Lynn Cullen. Uh, so Melissa straightened me out on some of the facts that I may have had wrong. But apparently, if you are a member of the House of Representatives, you can get up to at least 600 bucks a month in order to lease a car, and they'll give you mileage. So they give you the car. Yep. Car, you get to drive the car around, yeah. then you get to put in for mileage. I don't know the exact rule. But how I know absurd that it's is a that? Lot more generous than the you make money. You actually. I, but I mean, money. how? Don't you just get mileage if you drive your personal car? Isn't that the whole point? That's the way it should be. <laughs> it's outrageous. And oh. you need six hundred feet to lease a car. Right. Oh, you can see what some of these folks what are yeah. driving. Some of them are driving Lincoln. Mercedes and all that. SUVs or something. I mean, now, they, do they get to keep the change they if American they cars if they lease a four hundred dollar car? Do they get the keep? All right, you only get one. Which is so, which is the so the incentive is to lease the most expensive car. Sure. Unfortunately, that's true. And now, speaking do you, of what cars, about the in the Senate we lease cars? We can. And what do you do? I lease and I uh, claim miles that are business miles, just but like I would if it was my car. You're driving some uh, piece of crap, uh, you know, Edsel or something. That's a it's Pontiac. Not a, a Pontiac, yeah. That's speaking smart. of leased cars, <laughs> speaking of leased, one of the leased cars is reportedly or allegedly involved in a death. Yes. Now, uh, uh, County uh, Representative, who's, he's accused or uh, allegedly he was involved in a hit and run which killed the guy. Think that yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, Melissa's Did right. There's been no that? charges leveled yet. Right? No, there have not. These are just certainly oh, he's implicated it was after in the this investigation. This guy was hit, hit and killed. All of a sudden, lo and behold, uh, Representative Drews uh, goes to some place outside Philly and has uh, his leased Jeep at taxpayer expense. Has a bunch of fun of it taken care of, oh. and then as soon as it's repaired, turns the leased vehicle back in. They can't find. They don't even know where the dip is anymore. No. Parts of it. There's all. He was cover up. He was seen in the in Harrisburg. That is, you know, there's all sorts of things that that certainly cast suspicion. But of course, the facts that are in the newspaper article that all of us saw mm -hmm. was, of course, someone trying to put the story together as well as they could as well. I mean, I know this guy, and I'll tell you what, if I would have, if someone asked me who would be that actor in Harrisburg, I would not have picked him. Um, it's very bad. actor is an perpetrator, or actor is an acting. Bad guy. Okay, yeah. Bad actor. Just like hang out with cops or something. Uh, he perhaps would, yeah. No, I mean you. Yeah. You use that terminology. You anyway, got it. Uh, what's wrong with the legislature? You're killing people. You're wasting money. You're taking bribes. You're uh, committing perjury. What is wrong with the state though, man? You won't wake up the electorate. Yeah. To this vote is for why. The right this is why yeah. Melissa Hart is from Harrisburg to Washington. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Seriously though, I mean, you do. It, it looks like it's a pretty bad run of legislators. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. Some of these people look like they're in trouble, uh, pretty serious trouble, and they shouldn't be there if they're, you know, entrusted with, you know, the people's six of the seven, and business. Six of the seven are Republicans, which I find, mm -hmm. I personally think they're bad apples in both parties. This, yes, seems, this, seems, this seems to be a little higher percentage on the Republican side, six There's out of seven. Of 
They're just more, well, but not in the House. There's only three more of them than there are of the Democrats. And it comes at a very difficult time because right. this battle this year for control of the state house hinges on two seats. If two seats switch Republican to Democrat, the Democrats will have control of the state house. And why is that important? Well, for one reason, the General Assembly that's elected this November will redraw all these congressional districts that that's Melissa right. is running in and, if the and everybody else. If the Republicans lose the majority, then the Democrats will gerrymander the districts in an unbelievably ridiculous way. And, <laughs> and vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah. Right. And all right. So what about, because uh, we haven't got that much time left, the county council, uh, they're a bunch of nutty kooky cut-ups, keystone well, cops. Uh, they can't I elect the president, uh, but Tom Forrester is still dead. So he's no longer a factor. I guess they'll have to replace him with a north side Democrat from Forrester's district. Not uh, necessarily north side. It could be from downtown Lawrence or Island Park. Yeah. Or Millvale. The mayor of Millvale. I understand the mayor of Millvale is in interested in being the uh, councilman, for county councilman. So how the heck long is it going to take for yeah. these guys to to get well, the first order of business done well, and find I, a... They've been working to broker an agreement. I mean, you've heard Dr. Sims be forward as a compromised candidate, and perhaps that can happen. I mean, when we drew up the law that said, you know, this is how many council people they're going to be, we made sure there was an odd number, so this wouldn't happen. Um, unfortunately, you know, we come for with the problem. Right. And, and, and I think it's a little unfair to blame the other 14 county council members right. for the fact that uh, Tom Forrest was unable to participate. No, but you can blame them for being bickering people who can't come to a consensus. Uh, on other issues, but this is... It's well, on this issue, they can't pick well, a president. But they can't pick a president. They That's can't a pick thing. a president. You and can blame the Democrats on the council for getting behind probably the least qualified one among them, namely mm -hmm. Jumpin' Johnny DeFazio, who may in fact be a well. nice guy. I keep hearing he's a nice guy. And he wears cool glasses. And he, yeah, yeah, wonderful glasses. Yeah. But good. Heavens. Yeah. Well, you have seven of the nine Democrats, uh, seven of the nine participating Democrats voting for John DeFazio. Two of the Democrats have uh, benefited because there's been a five person block, a unified block of Republicans who have voted together as one in for Eileen Wagner. So, you know, I. You so can, let's put you the can bipartisan supported candidate in there. Well, it, does she have, does Eileen Wagner have an eighth vote? Uh, not that I know of. Yeah, well, that's, of. and that, of course, is the dilemma this Tuesday when they will be voting again. You'll have, uh, I understand, at least one more vote with Eileen Wagner and John DeFazio oh, as sakes. the candidates, a 7 7 tie. And then, I understand Mr. DeFazio is going to withdraw his name. And Let's hear it for Jumpin' Johnny. All and right. then the Ooh, question is. And they can have another vote. They can have <laughs> another vote. And it could be 7 7 again. 7 for Dr. Sims and 7 for Eileen Wagner. Well, I, she needs to withdraw. She is being an. Uh, obviously, but, obviously, Eileen, Eileen out. <laughs> and Jumpin' Johnny. I mean, obviously, this isn't going to happen for you, okay? And you need to so, get what, so you want a unanimous vote for Jim Sims? Absolutely. Uh, That's okay. what they well, need to do. Stop this nonsense. All right, case closed. In 60 seconds, should we send that uh, Gonzalez kid back to Cuba or not? Yes. Of course. <laughs> Why is anyone even trying to keep that poor kid here? It's oh, because it's a horrible dictatorship, and we can't send the kid back Hello, to Cuba. Hello, oh, family yeah. values. What about his dad? This, this yeah. is politics, politics, politics. Sickening. The Cuban, the Cuban-American population in Florida is an exceedingly important vote in the next presidential race. That's why you have George W. Bush and Al Gore both saying the same thing, yeah. which essentially is not to send the kid. I can't wrong. tell you how many Democrats I have heard have said Al Gore lost their vote this week. Oh, because he's in favor Absolutely. of keeping the kid here? and I'm one yeah. of them. That's How about it. that? Forget it. So you're a Bradley person now? Yeah, well, I don't know, but I'm not a Gore person. I, I was undecided. Be I'm careful. Not. She could turn into a Bush person. Oh. Oh. No, Bush is, no, Bush is the same as Gore yeah, on this issue. I could turn issue. into a McCain person. Yeah, that's no. right. I turned into a dog. <laughs> there we go. I can, I can see that. Well, they used to say Clinton was a Bush person, but that was a whole other thing. <laughs> Do you have an opinion oh. on that one? Oh. Uh, you know what? Oh. Yeah, I'm going to side with you guys to wrap okay. it up. Uh, <laughs> all you guys, Melissa, Lynn, and John, thank you so much for coming on the program tonight. Hey, coming up, uh, commentary with guest commentator John Rocker. Stay with us. <laughs> Tonight's commentary, and now a thoughtful word or two from one of the more profound spokesmen for today's younger generation, Atlanta Braves relief pitcher, John Rocker. 
Howdy, hi there, friends and neighbors. This is your tobacco chewing, venom spitting, back slapping buddy, John Rocker. I don't know if you've heard or not. I have repented. I am no longer the evil, racist, mean spirited, homophobic bastard that I was just a week ago. Hell, I've been hanging around with all sorts of Negroes. I spent a few minutes with Hank Aaron. Did you? Of course not, because I'm a big time athlete and you're just some AIDS ridden queer watching bad cable TV. Wait, strike that. That's, that ain't the new part of me. It ain't part of the new me. The new me is inclusive. I am a sensitive individual. In fact, I'm announcing the official John Roger, Rocker Reach Out to the Homos campaign. Yes, sir. Be a compassionate conservative. Take a queer for a beer. Just don't drink out of the same glass, if you know what I mean. <laughs> really, though, the damn homos ain't so bad after all. Once you get past their effeminate demeanor and limp-wristed gestures, you'll find out they're almost human. Kind of like an ugly dog or something. But hell, like my daddy always said, just cause a dog's ugly don't mean you can't let him sleep in the barn. And so, I'm announcing the construction of the new chain of halfway houses, John Rocker's Beds in the Barn for Queers with AIDS. Yes, sir. At prime locations throughout rural America, I plan to construct a home away from home for these homely homos who ain't fit to sit in the subway. Things work out. I may even expand to the John Rocker beds in a barn for unwed pregnant sluts who ain't fit for polite company. And hell, if that works, I may go even so far as to build John Rocker's bed in a barn for furriners with cooties who don't belong in this tree in the first place. Frankly, I ain't so sure about the last one. But queers and sluts who don't know when to keep their barn doors closed and welcome in the barns anytime. Negroes too, even the fat ones. Of course, you know when I was quoted as calling my teammate a big fat monkey, it was not a Negro at all. Hell, he's back. So you can't nail me on that one, no sir. I have been practicing saying things that are part of the new me so I can continue to for weirdo freakos of all race, creeds, and colors. For example, Hillary Clinton, she's my kind of gal. Now see, I couldn't say that about the lesbos was losers, not to infer that, well hell, never mind, I'm in enough trouble as it is. So join me in my new tolerance movement. You're about to sit on a queer and you're queuing up a big hawker. Just swallow your pride and lie through your teeth like the new talk. Thank you and good night. That's commentary, ladies and gentlemen. David Johnson is joining us momentarily with the uh, 10 o'clock news. Yes, I am. I'm waiting for the shot. I can't possibly follow that, so I'll just sit sure and smile. <laughs> what about that uh, Tommy Donahoe stuff? That, that was you? big, and we've got that coming right up. Uh, major, major news. He lost the, he lost the war. Do with that I'm one. shocked. I'm just shocked. I mean, I'm sad because apparently we won't have Tom Donahoe to come on the show anymore. And, uh, and he made several appearances. And he, he was, a, he was a funny as acre cagot. I had him show once. Donahoe was on a half a dozen times. Uh, now I'm screwed. Thus is your lot in life with trying to book guests. All from right. From the well, Steelers. <laughs> stay tuned for David All and right. uh, Johnny Fedko with the big update on the Donahoe thing. Oh, we have a little bit of time. We have more time, John. So let's, uh, why don't we expand it, and, and uh, John Fedko, uh, you got any exciting new things coming up here? No, we're just going to talk about the big uh, <laughs> happenings over at Three River Stadium tonight. Obviously, the Tom Donahoe did lose the power struggle, and that's exactly what it was. In fact, Dan Rooney went out of his way to make sure all of us knew that Bill Cower offered his resignation, so it came down to simply which resignation were they going to accept, and they decided to accept Tom Donahoe's. Bill Cower now stays. But the big part of this story also was that Bill Cower gets no more power. A lot of people thought that Bill Cower wanted to get Tom Donahoe's job and become the director of football operations and the Steelers head coach. Well, he's still going to only remain his coach, and the Steelers will go after a new director of football operations. As I told you on your show, John, I think it's going to be Tom Modrak. Hell, Hell, you don't even need to watch the damn news now. <laughs> but, but watch anyway, won't you? I uh, just spill the time for you. I'll see you Monday with Chris Conrad. No, I don't.